Hi guys, it's me again, and I'm here with another video for Schooled. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the history of editing and how it came to be what we know it as today. I'm going to do this in three simple sections. Section 1 is a history of editing, where we explore the origins of it and look at some of the work the pioneers created. In section 2, I'll be looking at the techniques used and adopted since the beginning. And finally, section 3 will be a look at modern day editing and how this has changed on and off the screen. Now, long ago, in a theatre far, far away, audiences were gathered to watch a film. A film like no other film during its time. What is this film, you ask? Avengers? Star Wars? The Hobbit? Nope, nothing quite on that scale. It was simply footage of a train moving. I know, right? Fascinating. Or at least it was for the people of the early 1900s. You see, back then, moving picture only just became a new thing. People would go to the cinema every weekend just to see an uncut clip of a moving train or galloping horses running across a field. And that's right, I said uncut. So it was all done in one take, and it was usually two to three minutes long. Storytelling through film wasn't even thought of until 1902, when people figured out that you can act out a play in front of a camera, and even then, all they did was place a camera far away from the stage and capture the performance. Then, in 1903, Edwin S. Porter created a film that's been credited as the first of its kind, a film to use advanced editing techniques. The film used editing to show the story of a burning apartment building from two perspectives, a woman trapped inside the building, and a group of firefighters. This was known as cross-cutting and parallel editing as you were telling two stories about the same events at the same time. Porter also utilised location filming by filming both on set and on location. However, it is unclear if Porter intended the parallel editing to establish that the two scenes were happening simultaneously to one another. In 1908, D.W. Griffith explored and experimented with editing at a Biograph studio. He did so by filming different shots of the action with different shots and then editing these together to make it fluid and seamless according to the emotional rhythm of the action. He also experimented with techniques that enabled him to join filming location that aren't physically connected but are within the story he is telling. For example, there could be a shot of a man walking into a house and then the next shot is the interior of a house, but it's not actually the house itself. It could be within a studio or on a stage. Griffith later became famous for his editing and his rides to the rescue scene that would usually climax a film. For example, in 1912, during the ending scene for The Girl and Her Trust, Griffith cuts back and forth from a pair of robbers who had abducted the heroine to shots of the hero who was trying to overtake the robbers on a train. In 1915, Griffith extended his fluid rise of continuity with his film Birth of a Nation, which is a brilliant example for cross-cutting as it tells four stories set in different time periods within a simultaneous fashion. In 1917, a Soviet filmmaker called Sergei Einstein wrote that Griffith's editing is similar to the class system of capitalism, as the lines of action in Griffith's editing remain separated like classes under capitalism. Inspired by the October Revolution, Einstein and other Soviet filmmakers developed a different and more radical approach to editing in the 1910s and 20s. He believed that editing was the foundation of film art as cinema did not lie in a single shot, but in the relationship among the shots which is established by editing. He called his films a dialectical montage because he aimed to expose the essential contradictions of existence and the political order. Lev Klushov, a teacher at Moscow's film school, promoted the idea that editing itself can help create facial expression and the impression of an acting performance. This is known as the Khrushchev effect, and many directors have used this technique in their films. When I first saw the French Nouvelle Vague, um, I, I instantly loved it. I loved the idea, I loved the way they edited and thought I would like to, to cut like that. 
J'aime une fille qui a une très jolie nuque, de très jolis seins, une très jolie voix, de très jolis poignets, un très joli front, de très jolis genoux. You know, Godard used jump cuts because it was like, well, why not? You know, there's nothing interesting happening in this middle part, so let's just go to a jump cut. When I saw Bethes, I was staggered at Godard's brutality. What they brought to editing was a breaking of the rules. Whatever books that said this is how it had to be done, they burned them. Breathless is too hip for me. I, I, I come from Lower East Side. I'm an Italian-American guy. It was, it's too beat, beatnik. It's like, you know, bohemian. It's too cool. I liked it. I don't know what the hell was happening in it. Back in 1917, before the days of editing was as glorified as it is today, a Dutch-born inventor named Iwan Surya created a machine that he had hoped would allow the general public to view films in their own home. This device was named the Moviola, which the name derives from the photographer Victorola. However, because this piece of machinery was expensive, it was never widely adopted by domestic households, and a mere 20 cabinets were created and sold to the public and motion picture studio executives. Now, one of the first tools to be used for editing was simply scissors and glue. However, they lacked the ability to view their work easily and see if any mistakes needed to be fixed. So therefore, Surya adopted the machine for use within a cutting room and became available for purchase in 1924, with a man named Douglas Fairbanks being the first customer. In 1930, Wilhelm Steenbach created the popular flatbed editor that he named after himself. The device was a flat, table-like surface that would allow cutters to lay down reels down horizontally on separate plates, then thread them through mechanical guides and sprockets. Eventually, the flatbed was commonly thought of as being far superior than the Moviola film editing machines in terms of its sound quality, monitoring and speed. The Steenback wasn't the only flatbed to be produced, however. Others, such as the Keller Electromechanic, KEM, which was also widely and commonly used, but most notably could support up to three tracks. The Moviola used a Geneva drive mechanism to advance the frames, whereas the flatbeds had adopted a rotating prism that would handle the film much more smoothly without as much wear and tear. It was also much more quieter, but even more importantly, it allowed for a higher speed of operation. In 1971, the first digital, non-linear editing system was created and was called the CMX600 and was introduced to the world by CMX Systems. The device cost $250,000 and was only suitable for offline editing with its main purpose to create an edit decision list. This list would take the EDL and then auto-assemble it in the final video program from video tape recorders. In the 1980s, companies such as Lucasfilm adopted laser edit and edit flex systems that allowed them to approximate non-linear editing by using banks and laser discs or VCRs. However, they were sluggish and clumsy to use. It wasn't until 1989 that Avid Corporation introduced Avid One, the first media composer system. Although at first the quality of the product wasn't great, it eventually improved, but was still only used for short projects such as commercials because the computers could only access a maximum of 50 gigabytes of storage at a time, which in the media industry isn't a lot. However, in 1992, computers were finally able to access up to 7 terabytes of memory, which allowed digital editing to be used on larger projects ranging from TV shows to big blockbuster movies. So therefore, more people within the industry began to switch over to digital editing rather than using analog. Other companies began to create software and technology used in the editing process such as Lightworks, but most notable was a small group that parted ways from Adobe's premier development team and created a new product that was later bought by Apple. This product later became known as Final Cut Pro and is the preferred software to edit with even up to this day alongside Adobe's version called Adobe Premiere and both have been used to make both small and large scale products such as the one you are watching this very moment. There are many ways that an editor can combine the various pieces of film 
and each will create a different type of effect to the final piece of film. In 1921, Lev Kulchov said, Film art begins from the moment when the director begins to combine and join together the various pieces of film. There are many different effects that can be created from various different styles, and here are just a few. The straight cut, which allows for a rapid jump from one image to the next. The fade, which is where the screen will turn to black. The dissolve, where there are two images and one is slowly brought in beneath the other. The wipe, where a new image will push off the old one off screen, which indicates that a sequence has finished and a new one has begun. The iris. This is when the shutter lens slowly closes to form a smaller and smaller circular picture which, like the white, indicates a new sequence. This can also be reversed for the similar effect. An editor will also have to follow the rules of continuity to help make his film seem more fluid and won't confuse the audience. Rules such as the 180 degree rule. This is where an imaginary line is drawn between characters in a scene that are talking to one another. The idea is that the camera will stay to one side of the line, which allows it to film only one side of a character's face looking in a certain direction. This will hopefully stop the audience from becoming confused during a scene as they can tell which character is talking to whom. Another is an establishing shot. This shot is usually the first shot of a scene, and will be a long shot, or an extreme long shot, to show off the setting of the scene that is about to occur. Finally, another continuity technique is called match cutting. This is when one shot is cut together with another shot to make it seem like the movement with these shots are seamless. With more and more technological advances such as green screen, CGI and now 3D, editors have more to deal with and to work around. So next, we will look at how editing is seen in the modern age and how some of the editors today view the industry and art form. So, th Matt. speaking of that, this is the, you're famously, you guys are the last holdouts on cutting on film and right. shooting on film, right. and, and now you're not for the first time. That's right. Is it completely different? Does it feel similar but just a different machine? What does it feel like for you? It's the same thing. The only difference is, if you take time to learn the machine, mm -hmm. the machine really makes no sense. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the way they've, you know, put it together. Right. So, but you can learn it. You can learn what markets for cut, what markets for overlap, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But I have somebody sitting here with me, mm -hmm. and I think fast, and she can, she makes the changes to me fast. First cut, I can do the first cut myself on that. But uh, she makes all the changes because there are a lot of tracks. Right. Six, seven, eight tracks and pictures. <laughs> and, and my God, if I had to do all that, I'd have a heart attack. Overall, I believe that it's obvious that editing has come a long way since the first pioneers. And let's be honest, it's for the better. I mean, can you imagine having to slave over a flatbed looking at the tiny film wheels just so you guys can make a bunch of notes on your essays or listen to me babble on whilst you check Twitter? Ha! No, sir. Now go off and do whatever it is you guys do and come back Friday when we look at the controversy that is the Star Wars movie.